the Bible tells us that because of God's great love for us, he has made us alive in Christ. And so if you have Jesus in your life, you have been taken from death unto life. And we will be singing a song that talks about that glorious day. So if you please rise with us and let's sing this song together.
no way cast out. We have come to worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in whose presence we are welcome. In Jesus' name and all God's people say.
God, you are my freedom all my days. Good evening. I'm Justine, and I've been attending GCF since I was three. I was technically raised in church, where I first came to know Christ when I was six years old, and even studied in ICS from middle school to high school. I had recommitted my life to Christ at least four times before I fully surrendered it back in 2017. Today, I have the privilege of working here as a full-time staff member. By the end of 2018, I was diagnosed with a bipolar 2 disorder a form of mental illness where my mood cycles between highs, known as hypomania, and more often lows, or depression. In between hypomania and depression, people with bipolar 2 typically live normal lives. Currently, I take three pills that help balance out my mood disorders, hormonal imbalances, and insomnia. Last September, I had one of my more serious suicidal attempts, Prior to this, my attempts ended with just thoughts or ideas of how I wish to kill myself. My depression started four months before when I had made a huge irresponsible mistake, which caused sleeplessness for me and those around me. I was running out of solutions as each option entailed someone else answering for my mistake, which felt wrong. That was when my suicidal thoughts began. It was the escape I wanted, even though it didn't solve the problem. I felt like I was a burden to everyone around me, and I didn't want to be that. I couldn't be that. Still, I would get up every day and did what I had to. It came to a point when I wanted everything to stop, because not a single ounce of joy was left in me. I just wanted to die. Memories started flashing back. Labels that were placed upon me 12 years ago seemed louder than ever, one of which was a comment that said that I was not a woman of my word. I was disliked because I couldn't live up to what I say. I thought that comment had passed since I promised myself that I'd never be that type of person again. Yet in that moment, it had never felt much truer because all my attempts had failed. So I prayed and made a deal with God that if he still had a purpose for the mess that I am, I would give him two weeks to show me anything that would make me want to stay. Any sign or help, just anything that would make me feel wanted or needed in this world. But each passing day grew darker and heavier. And on the last day, I woke up with a firm decision that I would do it. I came to work and teared up a few times throughout the day at the thought that it was final, wondering what will be said of me and what effect it would bring to my community. When I got home at 7 p.m., I cried while trying to reach my mom and my trusted friends. And at 10 p.m., someone finally responded. I was talking to a friend who always made me happy. I brought up the idea that I had wanted to kill myself, but dismissed it when I realized maybe she wasn't in the mood for it. We talked about other things, but ended the conversation with her encouraging me. It felt good in loading myself, but the pain and desire to die just didn't go away. The next thing I knew, it was 2 a.m., and I was standing on the balcony of our unit on the eighth floor. I was crying till my tears had dried, apologizing to God for what I was about to do. I messaged my friend to help me get out of it. Please talk me out of it. But understandably got no response, yet I took that as a sign to commit to jumping off. I leaned on the railing, swaying back and forth. How do I jump? What if I survive? Will I survive? Who will miss me and who will I miss most? Should I have messaged everyone that I love them? That I was doing this to leave them at peace? 
My mind was filled with a million thoughts as tears streamed again. I couldn't take it anymore, so I hopped on the ledge. One last deep breath calling out to God, when suddenly everything fell quiet. Quiet like the waves just stopped roaring. I suddenly found peace. I wanted to say it looked like I just shut off, but the vivid scene of a calm ocean at dawn was all I could see. And all I could hear was a loud, distinct voice hushing me to rest. I was tired. So I got off the ledge and went to bed. And that was the moment I felt God's presence, his love and care, how precious life actually is. And that was the moment it was clear to me that I needed to fully let go and trust him completely. I felt like a newborn being cradled to sleep, that while I'm fragile, he's got me wrapped around his arms. It was the most comforting, non-physical hug I had ever received. It was a voice with no sound that spoke louder than anything in this world. See, being a Christian and growing up with mental illness has caused me to constantly doubt and belittle myself. And even when that suicidal episode felt traumatic, it needed to happen for me to be reminded of the glimpse I saw of God's glory. It had also pushed my family and I to seek the professional help I needed. You see, mental illnesses aren't just a matter of the heart, but the body as well. His love and truth is constant, regardless of my imperfections or successes. In spite of my hurts and hurts, I've caused those around me. It was the reminder I needed to truly believe again in his power and his promises, in his truth and his comfort, in his peace and working hand. My depression and anxiety are still there, but I continue forward with a renewed sense of my living hope and with the help and support of my immediate community. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. It's now time to read scripture together. Please open your Bibles with me to Psalm chapter 42. Again, that's Psalm chapter 42. We'll be reading the whole chapter together. So in reverence to the reading of God's word, may I ask you to please rise. We'll be reading from Psalm chapter 42. Let's begin. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. May God add read blessing to the reading of His Word. Please be seated. Good evening, beloved. It is my joy to lead you in a time of prayer. You know that this is a part where we allow God's flock to experience the love of the elders and pastors as we pray for you in the middle. But I will be also asking you to join me in praying for the church and the country in the first part of the prayer. 
Then after a while, when we're done praying for the church and the Philippines, then I'm going to ask you if you have a prayer need. Well, it may not be a need. It may, not, it may simply be a, a, you know, a blessing. You, you want to praise God for something He has done, like a transition or a significant moment in your life. That's fine. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We will weep with those who weep. So will you join me? You probably have an idea this is not going to be an ordinary evening. Uh, everything from the beginning has been set up for you and I to realize the hope we have in Christ. And that includes the sermon tonight and this time of prayer. Let's join our hearts to pray. Lord, thank you for that powerful testimony of Justin. Even, Lord, the reading of your word, that plaintive cry. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And the deliverance, Lord, hearing hope in God, for I will yet praise him. Thank you, Lord for such a defiant attitude to something that sometimes makes even believers end their own lives. And Lord, we're here to talk about something that the, the church, our own church, is reluctant to t talk about openly because it seems embarrassing. And this has been going on to the, to the pain of those who are among us. So tonight we pray your spirit will enable us to love and welcome those who struggle like Justin in their midst, to remind them they are loved, they're welcome, and not shunned. Lord, we begin by praying for our elders and deacons, Father, who were newly elected. We thank you for them, Lord, for our uh, six new elders and our deaconess who are now part of the leadership of the church. Thank you for them, Father, and their willingness to serve you. We pray for your blessing on their lives and on their ministries, Lord, as they serve with us. We also, Lord, continue to pray even for the, this coming Sunday as we launch GCF, PNPA, our, our branch there in the, in the institution that trains the future senior officers of the police, the future colonels and generals, Father. Enable us as we put a pastor and an administrator there that this will become a center for evangelism and discipleship in the Philippine National Police Academy. We also pray, Lord, for our founding pastor, Pastor Dave. And Lord, we pray that as uh, he continues to recover from what he went through, the complicated surgery, that you'll be with him and PJ as they both battle dementia together. Thank you for the lives and ministries. Thank you for the GC efforts who keep voluntarily supporting them, adding to the fund we're creating for them. But Father, I pray that you be with them even as they have a new caregiver, a Filipina who will work with Pastor Dave and PJ to take care of them during the waking hours of the day. Thank you, Lord, for them and enable us to keep upholding them in prayer. Lord, now we pray petition you to have mercy on our country, the Philippines. We were informed, Lord, that the data for uh, millions of passports has been uh, taken away. And Father, we don't really know what this means. May or may not be a national security risk for the very people sitting in this congregation tonight. But we just pray it will not be, Lord, that there will be no identity theft, that there will be no misuse of the, the millions of passport data that have uh, been carried away, so as claimed by Secretary Teddy Loxin. Instead, we pray it will be resolved peacefully and quickly, Father. We pray the same way for the upcoming senatorial elections. Lord, help every person here value their one vote. Realize that it is a powerful thing to have one vote. And help us, Lord, to have the wisdom to see who will become the next lawmakers, the next decision makers for our country. May we choose based on wisdom, not on popularity. May we choose people, Father, who may not be popular but are more qualified than others and give us the wisdom, Lord, to choose and vote rightly. We finally pray for our country, Lord, with regards to the Bangsamoro Organic Law 
the plebiscite will be held from January 21 to February 6, Lord. And we realize, Father, how crucial this is to the future, not just of Mindanao, but to the whole Philippines. We don't really know what's right or wrong, whether there should be a, 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 an implementation of the BOL or not, but you do, Father. And our prayer is there will be peace in Mindanao. I believe every Filipino here in this room is either rooted from there or has loved ones and friends there. So, Lord, we pray for peace in Mindanao. Hopefully, oh God, this plebiscite will be used by you towards that end. And Father, tonight we would like to minister to your flock. We know that there are people you have blessed and will keep blessing in our midst. Lord, help us rejoice with them as they enter a new transition, a new job, a new relationship, perhaps an anniversary, a birthday. Or maybe there are people in their midst who are broken, Father, burdened about something or someone. Help them, O oh Lord. Just enable us to come alongside them when they stand for prayer as we ask them to do so tonight. Beloved, if you have a prayer need, it might be a blessing you, you're grateful to God for or you, you're broken about something or burdened about something. We'd just like you to stand where you are. And our pastors and elders are actually all around the place. They'll come beside you and pray with you. Stand where you are, move to the aisle, and our pastors and elders will be joyfully praying with you. And that includes the people in the balcony, by the way. So thank you, ma'am. Uh, Pastor Emmer, thank you for, is there anyone else? Just stand where you are. Thank you, uh, Pastor Parkin. Balcony, you're, you're part of the church. There are pastors there who are willing. Yes, uh, is there a, somebody come up here uh, over there? There's a brother who's standing for prayer in the balcony. Yes, Pastor Doug, thank you. Is there anyone else who's standing and the, uh, the rest of us, while they're being prayed for, will you just pray for GCF and the country? That's why you flash it on the screen, for us to keep praying silently while they're being prayed for. As our brothers and sisters continue to be prayed for, let me now pray for the message tonight. Father, we ask you to be glorified when we present Jesus Christ to your people, Father. We know that the problem of depression and even suicidal thoughts is even inside the churches of God, including this one. And rather than deny it's a problem, Lord, we would rather talk about it tonight. For the sake of those who are struggling, for the sake of those who love them and don't know what to do, for the sake of those who are looking for a place that they can find home, for the sake of those who are simply hanging on and asking if they can go on another day, we pray, Lord, that we will tackle this with sensitivity and love and yet with the wisdom that can only come from your Holy Spirit. We know that for the believer who is actually the subject tonight, who battles this, Christ and only Christ is the only way. The same Christ who saved us is the same Christ who can sustain us amidst the darkness of depression and suicidal thoughts. 
So be with us, O Lord, and enable us to see Christ in all His glory and in His love for us, the unseen friend who comes alongside us in our pain, who will always be there for us, who will welcome us into His kingdom someday. We ask for your presence in us and in our midst tonight, Lord Jesus Christ, because we ask this through you. Amen. Amen. We welcome you to uh, a series, uh, series we call Clear the Air. Clear the Air is a break in a regular uh, book series. You know, we're going to the book of Genesis. Uh, we go through books of the Bible by chapters, by paragraphs, by verses. But every January for three years now, we, we have a special series where we tackle what we call hot-button issues. You know, these are topics that, that are very, very uh, controversial or they're very thought-provoking, and you may, some of you may not have the patience to wait for us to, you know, chance upon it when we go through a book series. So we call it Clear the Air, you know, uh, burning issues confronting Christians today. So tonight, we're going to talk about very specifically the Christian and depression and suicide. Next Sunday, another hot-button issue is the Christian and money. Uh, it's God's money, and Pastor B.J. Sebastian will actually talk about it, and you know he's very qualified to do that, both as a pastor and as a businessman. And then on the last Sunday of January, which is also National Bible Sunday, we tackle the most controversial of them all, that's the Christian and political issues. We're going to look at Romans 13, but I warn you ahead of time, we're going to look at it in the context of the entire Bible. We're not going to treat Romans 13 as if it's an island by itself. We will look at it based on how Genesis to Revelation really takes it up. But tonight is about the Christian and depression and suicide. Our scripture reading was chosen because verses 5 and 11 of Psalm 42 have this uh, sentence. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? That's a dilemma. That's a dilemma. That's the dilemma of the discouraged, disappointed, or even depressed believer. They're asking, why am I downcast? Why am I disturbed? And then, by God's inspiration, he also gives the deliverance. Put your hope in God. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. There's both dilemma and deliverance in the same verse. But we're going to jump from that and tackle depression and suicide in the Christian. And you know what I love to tell you, 530 uh, worship service people? You get all the juicy things I get after every service. So you're going to get them in a while. But we combine topics from two previous messages. And uh, you must be asking, uh, why? Why are we taking these up? In the last nine months of 2018, unless you've been living in a cave, you know that there have been repeated reports of Christian youth and young adults who have unfortunately taken their lives. And it isn't just Christian youth and young adults. I'm referring to the Philippines. I, I keep myself updated, uh, not just in the medical field, even in, in what's going on in the rest of the world, in other ministries. I subscribe uh, to various publications. And in the past nine months also, there were three clergymen, three pastors, who had their churches who took their own lives. And one of them disturbed my daughter. Uh, so I'm going to share with you, with her permission, although she pinched me quite a bit to say, Daddy, uh, you know. Uh, last August 25, a pastor in Chino Hills, California, Pastor Andrew Stecklin, took his own life. On August 28, my daughter sent me this Facebook PM, private uh, message. She said, I think what happened to him was he was consumed by his mental illness. 
It's not because he lost hope in the Lord. Of course, I said, as her father and pastor. Yes, that's true. You're correct. Now, this is what he said. Isn't it nice to have a loving daughter? This is what he said. Uh, I know you're not prone to a mental illness. I hope you agree with her. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Let me read on. But let this be a reminder for you. Here's my daughter lecturing me. That just because you take care of so many people doesn't mean you shouldn't be taken care of too. We're here for you, Dad, if things get difficult. Love you. And all God's people said, ah. Anyway. Now, my response to her, I, I warn you ahead of time, I was joking, but this was my response to her. Thank you, baby. Just marry right, and I'll be glad all my life. But here's the part where I, I warn you. I was joking, I said. Besides, I have the tendency to kill people than kill myself. <laughs> it's nice to have somebody care for you. As she was concerned. I think all of us should be concerned. It's a reality. And I will tell you that even as I scan this congregation tonight, there are some of you who know what I'm talking about. You're battling this, either as part of bipolar or part of just plain clinical depression, or you're asking yourself, do I have this problem? Now, we have a choice. We can pretend it's not true in this church. Oh, it cannot be in GCF, maybe in other churches, but not here. Well, let me break the bubble for you. It's here. We cannot deny it's here. And it's a difficult topic. I have very limited time to take it up with you. So I, I want to tell you how I came here. Um, I've been preparing for the past two weeks. By Wednesday night, I was ready to send the outline uh, to the communications who print our wonderful bulletins. Then I realized when I prayed, I prayed before I sent and I said, what happened to me? Before I... Was I, as I was preparing, I was thinking there's going to be professional psychiatrists in the congregation. And so what I was about to send, you know, I was about to press the send button, was, was more like a, a medical thesis about to be defended rather than something meant for God's people. So I had to say, I cannot send this. I have to rewrite the whole thing. And I was blessed by some people including uh, our uh, friend of GCF, Dr. Villanueva, who sent me many articles that helped me look at depression in the Christian. And that's what we're going to take up tonight. In the limited time we have, because of, uh, we'll just look at four questions that need to be answered. I hope you understand this comes from even my own readings and experience and counseling. The first one is this, pastor. Why is there depression in the first place? Why, why is it even present in mankind? You know, it's just two words. The fall. That's it. It's also in your outline. The fall. When Adam and Eve, and Eve sinned, it put a curse on two, two things. They're actually just one. First is nature. The whole of creation. And then man himself. Received a curse. Romans 8, 20 to 22 speaks about the curse on nature. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice. Meaning, Adam's sin and God's judgment. And then, we talk about the curse on man himself. Paul mentioned that in Romans 7, 24. When he said, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? We have all been affected by the fall. No one has been immune from it. All of nature. So, that's why you have typhoons. They kill Christians and non-Christians. Yeah, you know, recently, people have been bringing back, you know, the specter again of the mega quake. Yeah, you know, I'm beginning to get tired of it. They keep warning us, the mega quake is coming. I finally realized, you know, if it ever comes, I don't think any one of us will survive. Uh, so, 
It will kill Christians and non-Christians because of the curse on nature. But the curse on our bodies, beloved, includes the effect on the brain. The brain is the most complex organ of the human body. And it is liable to be the most affected by the fall and the divine curse on our bodies. And so when a person comes to us, and, and whether he's a Christian or not, because we all carry the same fallen body in a fallen world where the ozone layer is no longer intact, where man has damaged the environment, polluted it with preservatives and chemicals, and we also feed it into our bodies, both Christians and non-Christians will be struggling sometimes with biological processes affecting their moods. So we are not in one extreme or the other. You see, one extreme is this. It's all spiritual. When you have depression, it's all connected to sin. You know, I, I decided not to bore you tonight by showing you MRI. You know my background. It used to be in the brain when I was in medical practice. I'll not bore you by showing you MRIs that in depression, there are uh, organic changes in the brain visible in MRI. I just hope you understand. We will not go there in the interest of time. But neither are we on the other side. That says it's all physical. So it's not your fault if, if you do this. Because we don't know that either. It's a complex interplay of the biological and the spiritual and the emotional and the environmental. So if you'd like to open the medical textbook, they'll tell you we don't know exactly what causes depression, but it's an interplay. We agree with that. But I hope you do not fall into one of two extremes. It's all spiritual or it's all physical. It's an interplay. Why am I saying this? Because, beloved, mental illnesses are real disorders that often have origins in faulty biological processes. In Deuteronomy 28, 27 to 28, God mentions to Israel, warning them, if you'll not be faithful, part of the curse is to you. And God then will enumerate balls, tumor, sores, blindness, as if and together with madness to say they all have a commonality. They're all biological. So, beloved, mental disorders do not discriminate. They're found in Christian. They're found in non-Christians. Second question. But, pastor, aren't Christians supposed to be immune? I mean, we're saved, aren't we? So why are we going to battle this? Don't we have any advantage? Of course we do. Once you receive Christ by faith, once you recognize you are a sinner who cannot be saved by good works, and we put our faith in Christ alone, we are saved by faith alone. But it doesn't mean that immediately your body and my body is free from all illnesses. We still carry around the same body which is fallen and we're still living in a fallen world. Uh, let me explain, beloved. It's like the man born blind. R remember that incident in uh, John 9, 1 to 3. Uh, the disciples were walking along and then they saw this man born blind. Uh, they didn't know he was born blind, but they wanted to ask the master who has all the answers to every question. They said, uh, Master, who sinned? Uh, this man or his parents? You know what's wrong with that question? It presumes that everything is connected to sin. And Jesus would have to teach his disciples that, no, it's not the man, not his parents. This happened that the work of God might be displayed in us. Beloved, sin may cause or aggravate depression and anxiety, and it may cause or aggravate even heart disease or other diseases. But... It doesn't mean you and I can have diseases simply because we're living in a fallen body, in a fallen world. It's like this. Uh, if you tell me, Pastor, I am taking maintenance medication for hypertension. Uh, what, how will you feel about me if, if I say to you, you're taking medicine for hypertension? You're a sinner. Repent. 
I don't think you like me. Well, you develop hypertension because you have a fallen body. You're living in a fallen world with a fallen environment. Why do we treat mental illness differently? It's the same, beloved. If our default position in dealing with depression is, it is sin, till proven otherwise, we fall into the same error as the disciples. And I hope we're wiser than that. I answered the two questions quickly because the third and fourth will take up a lot of our time. The third question is this. How do we know who are the clinically depressed and therefore at risk of suicide? This is what I love about the Bible. The Bible is a very realistic book. I mean, you read the Psalms, and if you read many of them, you'll realize that many of them express what is in our hearts. Uh, we can cry about how people treat us. We can cry about our feelings. We can cry about God to God. And that's in the Psalms. And we call this actually the Lament Psalms. And we had the privilege of studying them last Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. The, David and the other psalmists did not deny what they were feeling. In fact, they expressed it to God. They interacted with Him in the context of their depression. And tonight, we're going to get a little technical for a little while. Just a little while, I promise you. We're going to use what we call in medicine the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, 5th edition. As a shortcut, we call it the DSM-5. I'd like you to look at the clinical diagnosis because I want you to see later it's found in the Bible. So, how do you diagnose clinical depression? In a two-week interval, there must be five out of the nine uh, enumerated things, and the five must contain one of the first two, uh, depressed mood or diminished interest or both. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, all of these, five out of these nine must be present for a two-week period, and they must include the first two. And then next slide. Don't want to dwell on this. They must no, no, go back, please. They must cause significant impairment. I'm trying to make sure you understand the difference. You know, some of us will watch a sad movie, you know, and then the movie is very, very sad. You cannot go out of a movie and say, that movie was clinically depressing. Uh, no. Uh, it's different. It has to occur in a two-week period uh, with five out of these nine symptoms we showed you, and they must cause significant impairment to be diagnosed that way. Now, I'm saying this because here's the point. Next slide. There is a very famous man in the Bible whom I believe went through all of this. Uh, out of the nine, he had about six or seven. Thank you, Joey. Uh, this is David. King David, the famous King David, who wrote many of the Psalms, including the Lament Psalms. Uh, these are part of the nine things we showed you. And these are all his symptoms found mostly in the Lament Psalms, but one is found in, in the incident in 2 Samuel when David did not go out as kings normally do to defend their country. He outsourced it to his generals. But depressed mood, one of the first two criteria. Significant weight loss or decrease in appetite, Psalm 102. Insomnia, Psalm 66. Psychomotor retardation, uh, Psalm 38. Fatigue or loss of energy, that's Psalm 22. Feelings of worthlessness, again Psalm 22, although that is a messianic psalm. They were also the feelings of the psalmist at that time. Diminished ability to think or concentrate. That's found in the account in 2 Samuel and 1 Kings, recurrent thoughts of death, uh, again found in Psalm 22. The great King David was not immune to it. It's not just David. I'm going to show you another table that shows. Sometimes you can have suicidal thoughts with or without clinical depression. So, one of them was Moses. This is acute distress. In Numbers 11, God and Moses were conversing. 
And in the midst of the conversation, uh, Moses actually told God, you might as well end my life if this is the situation. Uh, aren't you glad God, God doesn't listen to us when we say that? But that's Moses. Acute distress. Elijah would probably fit better into clinical depression. Remember him? Running from a, a scary woman named Jezebel. Uh, he was more scared of Jezebel than of the king because she was really more scary. She said, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. Uh, because Elijah had just killed all the false prophets. So he's running for his life. He enters a cave. He tells God, I want you to take my life, Lord. End it now. And that, I think he probably fits the criterion of clinical depression. Job, remember Job? Uh, he lost all his children. He was able to handle it. He lost all of his money, lost everything. His possessions, either to plunder or to calamity, he could still handle it. But when he lost his health and the respect of his wife, in Job 6, 8 to 11, he couldn't take it anymore. And he wanted the quick way out. Jonah is acute distress. It's not clinical depression. Remember the story? He was telling the people in the ship, you're all going to die because of me. Throw me overboard. That's a desire to die. And you know they did. And then, of course, the Philippian jailer. Another incident or example of acute distress leading to suicidal thoughts. Why am I showing you all of this? I hope you do not have the wrong response. Like, oh, I want to be biblical. I want not to have suicidal thoughts. That's not the response. I hope you're seeing this to realize, first of all, all of these people may have felt these thoughts, but God never said yes. God never agreed to any of it. That's one. Number two, I hope you realize that God captured all of this for you to realize the struggle is real. It happens to the best of them. It happened then, it happens now. You're in good company. But if God did not let them go, neither will he let you go. Are you following me, beloved? I hope this is what you get from this. Because that's how God will take care of you. That's why you and I should never lose hope as believers. And I'm talking about believers. This topic tonight is about depression and suicide in supposed believers as you and me. And I hope you understand why I am so, so fired up about this. Because it's in this church. And we cannot add to the pain of those already battling this inside this church. After the 1030 service this morning, somebody came to me and said, Pastor, last Sunday when I was uh, looking at the bulletin, I realized you're going to talk about depression and suicide today. And he said last Sunday, this is not going to be interesting to me. In other words, he said, I'm going to be bored next Sunday. Then he said, last Wednesday, one of his children came to him, his 18-year-old, and told him, I want to die. He almost fell off his chair. And he said, let me talk to you. He said, no, I don't want you to counsel me because you're just going to scold me. I want you to go to GCF and find me a counselor. And so I will help that family. And so he realized, this affects all of us, beloved. Last night, after the traditional worship, I saw in the audience someone my, whom my wife and I had been counseling. And I knew, I knew she was gaining strength from the message. So I asked her after the service, how are you doing? I knew she had been taking medications for major depression. She said, Pastor, the psychiatrist actually increased my dosage. And I told her, you know that we're here for you, Joy and I, my wife and I. You just let us know. And she said, I will get in touch with you. It's here. It's with us. And we can make life very miserable for those who have this. By making them feel abnormal or weird or rejected or branding them insane. Or you could listen to Justin and realize 
They need our prayers. They need our help. Not stigma. Not shunning. They're part of us. They're with us. So let me answer the final question. How do we help those struggling with depression? Now in your bulletins, I'm, I, I made sure it's there because I can mention all of them. We talk about what not to say. I believe this is very important. You know why? Because I do counsel depressed people. And I made these mistakes. Um, I've, I've said some of these wrong things to say. And I really repent that I did. You know what one of them is? You know, snap out of it. Pull yourself together. You know what? That might be right in principle, but it's extremely insensitive in, in, in actuality. You know why? Because when you talk to depressed people, one of them describe it this way. It's like you're drowning. But unfortunately, when you're drowning in the sea, you know it will end with either death or rescue. But when you're depressed, it's like you're drowning. You don't know how to swim. The, wat the waters keep coming and, 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 and drowning you, but you don't die. And that's every day. Another described her depression as like this. It's like you're in a pit. And the pit is so deep. The sides are so steep. And, and you cannot climb out. So when somebody describes her life or his life like that, and you tell them, snap out of it, you know, pull yourself together, it's extremely insensitive. What else? you got nothing to be sad about. Don't be so emotional. You get over it. You know what that's called? It's trivializing. It's like telling them, you're so immature or you're so weak. It doesn't help them. You may be right, you may be wrong, but I want you to know it doesn't help them. What else? You know, uh, well, it's in your outline and put in the PowerPoint. You should confess your sin. Beloved, sometimes you might be right. But your name, unless your name is the Lord Jesus Christ, you're probably wrong. You're not omniscient. You know who has the right to say it's probably related to sin? You know who has the right to say that? A trained counselor, whether it's a lay counselor, a pastoral counselor, a, a, a licensed psychologist, or a psychiatrist who has come alongside you and prayed with you for many sessions, then maybe they can say, you know what, the root is a sin problem, or the root is a biological problem, but it's being aggravated by sin. Those are the people who can say it's connected to sin, but not the majority of us. And again, you may be right, you may be wrong, but we cannot simply say very, in a very dismissive way, just confess your sins. You'll be fine because you're not omniscient. We don't know that. And that's what not to say. What can the struggling believer do for himself or herself? Like I told you um, earlier, we were blessed uh, last Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the pastors of GCF. And we invited the satellites on our annual retreat. We were blessed. We had a speaker who, who is uh, an expert in the Psalms. I was blessed by many of the things he said. But the thing that blessed me most in what he said was when he told us his testimony that he had battled depression as a pastor and he had overcome it. So I requested our speaker can I join you for lunch? Because I'm preaching this coming Sunday. And I asked him. He's actually sitting with us, but I haven't asked his permission to mention his name. So I cannot say. I asked him at lunch, what were the things that helped you overcome depression? He mentioned two things. They're there in your outline. The first two. The first one is admit you need help and ask for it. You know, I come from a medical background. What would you think if, you know, you were my patient? You came to my clinic. There's an arrow sticking in your head, you know. It's coming out the other side. You tell me, pastor, ah, doctor, I have a big headache. And I said, of course you have. There's an arrow sticking out of both sides of your head. And you say, no, 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 you, you must subject me to MRI. 
uh, and CT scan and x-ray and treadmill stress test, then I'll believe you. Uh, otherwise, I will not think you're a good doctor. You know what the problem with that is? Unless you're willing to admit there's a problem with you, you will never get diagnosed. And in medicine and in depression, the first step to treatment is the right diagnosis. And the first step to a right diagnosis is to admit you need help. I'm trying to make it easy for us who suspect this might be your battle to admit it. It's better to admit or to at least suspect it because you will be doing something rather than saying it's not part or it's not true because you will never ask for help. Number two, our dear speaker said a second thing. He said it's community, and that's very biblical. Beloved, I hope you realize this. Christianity is community. It's the very essence of Christianity. Haven't you ever wondered, why is it that when Jesus saves us, it's nowhere in the four Gospels that he says, okay, now that you're Christian, find yourself a good cave or a monastery or a convent, and then hold yourself up in that cave and isolate yourself from the sinful world. Why is it the very opposite? Why is it that when Jesus was leaving physically, he told his followers, go, go into all the world, make disciples. You know why? Because Christianity is community. But if you're, you know, if you're normal, uh, like me, I'm normal, okay? I'm not going to commit suicide, I'm not going to kill anyone, okay? If you're normal like me, what do we usually do when we have a very depressing situation in life? What? We withdraw, right? Oh, I have this big problem. I don't want to talk with anybody. I know it's against our feelings to do it. And it's maybe okay for a short while. You know, when you're in the midst of deep distress, go ahead and withdraw, but don't make it too long. Because, beloved, the more depressed you are, the less you should isolate yourself. Because that's how Christianity works. We're a community, a caring one. Don't fight the battle alone. So let's make this practical. If you're part of this church, find a counselor. I'm not boasting about our counseling ministry, but, beloved, it's working. In our setting, GCF, there's a system of referrals. I just talked with the head, uh, Dr. Yoit Roldan. It begins with lay counselors. The next layer is the pastoral counselors. After that, there are licensed psychologists. And after that, there are psychiatrists who sometimes need to use medications. Uh, about medications, uh, why do we use that? Well, uh, if you have pneumonia and then you take antibiotics, how will you... How will you Respond to me if I come to you and say, I heard you have pneumonia. I heard you're about to die from pneumonia. And now you're taking antibiotics. Oh, you of little faith. Why are you doubting God? You just pray. Of course not. You got pneumonia, you're about to die, you take antibiotics, right? Why do we treat mental illness differently? If it has biological components. Why do we look at people who take medications as if they're abnormal? It's like the one who gave her testimony here. She is taking medications. If you talk to any good psychiatrist worth his license, they'll tell you, we hope those medications are temporary, like a crutch for a broken arm. They're not supposed to be there forever. And we will pray with Justin and other people like her, you know who you are in our midst, who are taking medications that one day you'll be free of it. But that's what you do. What else? Find a welcoming group of believers, as a gro like a growth group, a support group. We have various uh, groups like that here. You see, depression makes you believe a lie. It tells you you're alone and you should always be alone. And you know that's not the Christian way. God is with you, beloved. And sometimes I suspect there's a demonic component to it. Satan sees a depressed Christian. He knows depressed Christians tend to have negative self-talk. And he'll probably try to make you believe, you know, everything that you're telling yourself is all true, even when it's not. 
So, beloved, find a welcoming group of people who will pray with you, pray for you. What else? Number three, don't forget the most basic things. Philippians 4, 6 to 8, prayer. Don't be anxious, but in everything by prayer, present your request. What happens? The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. It's still there. It's still valid. It's still true. What else? Personal environment. Look at it. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right. Did you see that, beloved? These are all positive things. Pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Paul saying, you have the power to create your own positive internal milieu, environment. Uh, if you're like me, you know, there are certain things that can cause sad feelings. You know, for some people, uh, it's sad love songs. Well, if you're depressed already, uh, will you please look at your Spotify account? If it contains sad love songs that make you want to kill yourself, delete them, okay? Uh, you get what I'm trying to say? If you like art, you know, you go to art museums, and then you have these paintings that, that are dark, you know, surrealistic. You know, go to other paintings. I mean, create your own environment. God gave you that power. You know, I was telling somebody uh, earlier this morning, you know what? If this wasn't in the Bible, if it was in a text of psychiatry, it would still be correct. Whatever is true, novel, right, pure, think about such things. But God in his wisdom made sure it would be Paul who'd say it. Create your own positive internal milieu. Numbers 4 to 5, beloved, are now from my heart as your pastor to you. I call this a Christocentric proposal for believers. Number 4. When alone, focus on Christ. You see, I advise that as much as possible, you really be part of a community. But there will be times you will be alone. Here's my proposal to you. Immerse yourself in the life of Christ. Look at the most unselfish being who ever lived. And realize he is a historical figure. He was born. He did live. He did walk on earth. He did live a sinless, perfect life. He did hang on a Roman cross, condemned as a criminal. He did die. He did rise again. He is returning. He is inside you. If you receive him by faith, he is real. And sometimes in the darkness of depression, we forget this. I hope you remember the reality of Christ, no matter how how difficult it is for you. What else? The love of Christ. The love of Christ shown at the cross. I keep saying this every communion. You know that. Let's ask, let's stop asking God to prove himself to us. The cross is God's statement, I love you. Stop asking me to prove I love you. But look at also the statements of Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Find the love of a Savior there. Uh, rest. Take my yoke upon you, and you will find rest. Find the love there, beloved. Look at the power of Christ healing the woman who had been bleeding for years. He... Raising the dead when it would relieve the pain of a family. Look at the power of Christ and then look at the wisdom of God and Christ. And how the whole scriptures work together to make sure you realize Christ did not die by accident. He was not a, an unfortunate martyr victimized by people who wanted a political leader. He was a willing sacrifice. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Beloved, I propose to you, if you're battling depression, look at Christ. Look at his life. It's there in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read it for yourself. I've done this, so I can tell you that it works.
I've asked people to do this. It has worked for them. One more, beloved. Focus your mind on God's love for you. You know what I love about, could you now, could you take your bulletins, please, and uh, look at the back? You know what I like about Justin's testimony? We did not talk to each other. Hindi po kami nag-usap. We did not say, oh, Justin, I'm your senior pastor. I command you to say these things in your testimony. Nor did she say, oh, pastor, what are you preaching about? I want to make sure we align. I want you to read one of her statements where she said, when she was about to jump, that was when I felt God's presence, how much he cares for me and how much he loves me. When she was about to do a very irreversible thing, like killing herself, what kept her? It was the reality that God loved her. One of the staff sent me an article that said, loving Jesus doesn't automatically cure suicidal thought. I responded to our staff and said, exactly. It's not my love for him that cures suicidal thoughts. It's realizing his love for me. It's not my grip on Jesus that will keep me from losing hope. It's his grip on me. My grip is weak. Your love, my love is weak, but his love for us is infinite. It helped Justin. It can help you. I want us to read together as a very practical way of applying this thought. I will tell you ahead of time. This is copy-paste from the Bible. These concepts are not mine. They're written all over the New Testament. And they were, the concepts are even in the Old Testament. So I want you to read this with me. And I want you to read it for yourself. You know, I want you to own this. I want you to believe this is for you. This is not by Pastor Larry for you. This is God to you. Please read this with me. As a believer in Jesus Christ, I was chosen before the foundation of the world, predestined for adoption as a son of the living God, purchased out of slavery to sin and death, forgiven of all my sins, past, present, and future, given spiritual wisdom and revelation, and marked as such until the day I stand before him holy and blameless. Pastor, I am such a deep hole. I don't feel this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter if you're sitting there and you're saying, I don't believe you. I can't feel it. It doesn't change anything. This is who you are. This is how God sees you. Even if you don't feel like it. This is who you are in Christ. In the 10.30 service, one of our elders told me, Pastor, during the time that we ask people to stand for prayer, you know, I haven't preached then. He said, Elder Joel Liao said, one of them, the people I prayed for said, I came here because I want to jump off the building. And you know what? He said, God used him to talk to that man and bring him to our counseling center this morning. Was that man a Christian? I believe he was. But sometimes we forget this truth and we lose our hope. And I hope you never lose your hope because this is who you are. I hope you never forget this. This is how God sees you. I hope you see yourself the way God sees you, beloved. And fifth and last, this is from my heart to you. Choose to trust Christ even while it's dark. Those of you who have been through depression or are in the midst of it know what I'm talking about when I say while it's dark. Those who are in the midst of a depression, one of them describe it like this. You literally walk with head down. You do not want to see ahead. You just want to see your steps. You just want to make sure you do not fall down. 
You cannot even look up. So when you look at some people who are clinically depressed, that's how they walk. They literally walk with their head down. Their way is literally dark. So here's what I want you to see. You make a choice to trust Christ while it's dark. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is a choice. Faith is not something you're supposed to, to have. I get that sometimes from my counseling pastor. I don't have faith. I'm sorry. I said, don't apologize to me. You're not supposed to have faith as if I will hand it to you. When you're a Christian, it's in you. It's a decision. It's a choice. You know, I, I, I haven't reached the point of telling them, you can still make decisions. For example, you came into my office fully clothed. You're not naked. You can still exercise choices. You can exercise. Trust. You can decide, I will trust Jesus. I don't see him. I don't hear him. I don't feel him touching me, embracing me. He's there. The other question is, oh, Pastor, my faith is small. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be big as long as it's on the right object, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all that matters, beloved. Choose to trust. Maybe most of you have been through a train or a subway train that goes through a dark portion. People will think there's something wrong with you when the subway train goes through a dark portion and you stand up and say, oh, I want to jump off the train. Why? Because it's dark. Uh, people will say, hey, you need to be restrained. Why? Because it will not last forever. When you're in the midst of a depression, that's how it feels. It's like it will never end. Beloved, in the train of your life, the Lord Jesus runs it. Will you trust the one who runs your life until he can take you out of that darkness? Don't jump off the train. It will not solve anything. But just to convince you, I'd like you to look at this. I'm running out of time. I apologize will be over time a bit. Pastor Steve Bloom wrote the book Broken Minds. It's his autobiography of his struggle with clinical depression and suicidal thoughts. He shared this, beloved, as the reasons not to commit suicide. And I hope it will help maybe someone here today. First, he said, it's a sin and would bring shame to Christ. It would please the devil and weaken those trying to fight him. Here's a good one. It would devastate family and friends. What else? It's true. Our God is a refuge. Psalm 910. Those who know your name will trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. What else? Next slide. And this is what came to my mind when I was reading Justin's testimony. You see, if you jump from the eighth floor of a building like she was thinking, you know what the worst could be? You may not die. In fact, you may end up severely disabled, still depressed, and this time unable to kill yourself if you're paralyzed, you know. So don't even think about it. Uh, what else? Help is available if you really ask. If you're a Christian, Jesus Christ is praying for you. And then God will keep you until you reach a day when your pain will truly be over. Beloved, this is from the horse's mouth. This is from a pastor who struggles, and maybe until now struggles. But it works for him. What can the church family do to help? Beloved, the church has four things. No medical institution could ever copy. It has a hope that transcends circumstances. No, no hospital can offer that. The church has a holistic view of people, body, soul, and spirit. Uh, you know, unsafe psychiatrists can only tell you your body and soul need help. It has accessibility. You know, you go to a psychiatrist, how much do you pay per hour? 3000 per hour and a long line, appointment. The church is open 24-7, a supportive community. So here's my argument. Next slide, please. Let me be specific. 
GCF. That's why GCF should be a safe place for those who struggle. We need to end the shame. This church must not cause difficulty for those who are struggling, who are on medications, who are under counseling, who are seeing psychiatrists or the pastors. They must not feel they are abnormal or weird. They must not feel stigmatized or shunned. We could do so much for them. Let's be God's arm of love for them, beloved. You see, God wants us to rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. I'd like you to know this. This is as much our trial as it is that of the person with the mental illness. Look at the word illness. Somebody sent this to me on Facebook. If you replace the letter I with we, it becomes wellness. Can't we be that to so those who struggle with mental health among us? We become agents of God's wellness for those who have mental illness. Finally, beloved, for our final thoughts, depression can't rob you of hope because your hope is in a person. And that person is Jesus. He is with you and he'll never leave you or forsake you. There's a song that says, does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth and song? When the burdens press and the cares distress and the way is weary and long. You know what I like about that song? In Tagalog, it's palaban. The chorus is defiant. The chorus says, oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touching my grief. You know, if there's anyone who had the right to be depressed, it would have been the Apostle Paul. Because of time, I'll no longer read for you 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. In fact, if you're depressed, do not read it you'll be even more depressed. It's the story of how Paul survived all the hardship of his life. Persecution, false brethren, churches accusing him of being a false apostle and so on. But look at his last words, beloved. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Outwardly, we're wasting away. But inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs all of these problems we're going through. So we fix our eyes on what, on who is unseen. Not on what is seen. For what is seen is temporary. These things, they're not forever. But what is unseen? But who is unseen is eternal. I'm going to ask the singing group to come, and I'm going to request you to join them in the song I just quoted to you as the offering is passed, and then we'll be ending this time in a word of prayer. Please join us in the song.
personally are struggling with depression or you know someone who is please avail of the resources of our counseling ministry I want this message to be practical and I'd like you to avail of that I just want to make sure you get the help that you need let's pray Father will you please let the chorus of that song become our very own oh yes he cares I know He cares. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, Lord, help us make that our own battle cry. And Lord, when our feelings simply are so out of whack, Lord, we can choose to trust in You, a God who does not let us go, a God whose love for us is bigger than even our biggest failures. Enable us to, to just keep trusting you while it's dark. And Lord, bless your people as they go. May they realize how much every Christian is so deeply loved by you. And may that be the source of strength in your people. The reality that they are so deeply loved. This we pray for your people. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. You go with God.